Hello everyone and welcome back to another Tuesday Meet a Scientist lesson. Today we have a very special guest and someone who's taught with Headwaters a bunch in the past, Daniel Dudek. How's it going, Dan? Um, it's going really well here. You know, it's a bit hectic with everything going on, but you know, st just staying quarantined in the location where I'm at and, you know, taking it day by day. That's great. So I'll give you all a little bit of an introduction on Dan and why he, we're really excited to have him talk today and then he'll share his presentation. So Dan just finished his master's in evolutionary biology at the Indiana University of Pennsylvania, during which time Dan's been an incredible instructor for Headwaters, both at some of our Pennsylvania programs and out here in California. Um, going next, Dan, I'm right in that you're moving on to the University of Texas at Arlington for a PhD? Yep, that is correct. Cool, that's very exciting. Um, and today's, uh, Dan is going to be sharing some of the research that he did on his master's project, um, studying frogs um, and their, uh, how they're related to each other. Um, and so I'm gonna turn things over to Dan. If you have any comments or any questions, you can leave them in comments at the end of his presentation where we'll go through some audience questions. All right, Dan, you're on. All right. Well, again, thank you for having me. Um, today, like he said, I'm just going to be talking a little bit about my master's work at Indiana University of Pennsylvania. Um, it's sort of work that I've done to build a framework for other studies moving forward, including some of the work that I'm going to be doing in my PhD at University of Texas at Arlington. Um, so yeah, I'll get right into it. So what kind of research do I actually conduct? Um, I study the evolution of amphibians in Central America. So those of you who aren't too familiar with amphibians, um, you know, they're the sort of typical frogs, toads, Sicilians that you would find that are close to, you know, bodies of water. Um, they have to stay by bodies of water because they need to be surrounded in an in, in environment that contains a lot of moisture. And that's because um, they have cutaneous skin, which I'll get into in a little bit. But because of this, they're very sort of sensitive to environmental fluctuations. So climatic fluctuations or any sort of, you know, sudden changes in their environment. So it makes them really interesting to study for um, evolutionary patterns and um, sort of how they move throughout the land. Um, and sort of my study system that I use um, are Rana. So Rana are true frogs. True frogs are going to be your typical frogs that you see. Um, they're ubiquitous. They're sort of the most abundant ones that you will find. Um, and it makes sort of conducting research on them relatively easy. But at the same time, um, you know, they typically get overlooked. I don't know if this is because they're so ubiquitous, um, but a lot of their sort of the genetic relationships between all various rana throughout Central America seems to be pretty unknown and no one has really um, dove into that sort of side of research. So what is phylogenetics? Uh, basically, you know, there's, there's a lot of complex definitions, but I'm going to simplify it down to just this. Um, using DNA to compare the evolutionary relationships between organisms. So on the left, you know, we have this little diagram showing you an evolutionary tree or phylogeny that's depicting how these specific organisms are related to each other. So we can see that, you know, you have the domestic dog um, closely related to the wolf, and then, you know, they are sister to, you know, this entire group. Um, so this is essentially what I create. I create um, trees of life or phylogenies using genetic data. And then on the right is actually sort of some of my gel electrophoresis um, experiments that show the DNA fragments that I was able to amplify during a PCR reaction. So basically what I do there is I take one portion of the DNA and I amplify it, I make a bunch of copies of it, and then in doing that, I'm able to submit that to a company where they sequence it, and I can then look at all of the A, T, Cs, and Gs that make up 
that gene or that fragment of DNA. So let's jump to why study true frogs. So, you know, I mentioned how, you know, true frogs and those are the types of um, organisms that I study mainly. Um, species of Rana are found living in a variety of ecosystems throughout Asia, Europe, and the Americans. In, in the Americans. So North America, Central America, and more of the sort of top half of um, South America. You can't really find them as you go south too far, but sort of in that sort of Central America, South America sort of connection, you can find them there. Um, they have been used as model organisms in most disciplines within biology. So, um, you know, whether it's ecology, behavior, evolution, genetics, um, pretty, pretty much every field of biology, they have used Rana as a model system or true frogs as a model system. And some of you watching may have even used these frogs to learn physiology in your high school or middle school classrooms, in your anatomy classrooms, because the frogs that you would typically use for dissection are the ones that I study that are shown here. They're members of leopard of pantherana, which is the leopard frog group. Um, but the one thing that makes these really, these organisms truly unique is that they have sort of cutaneous skin or breathable skin. So, you know, frogs have two modes of um, getting oxygen into their body. They have lungs, but they also breathe through their skin. So um, gas exchange actually occurs you know, over their skin, which is why they need to stay close to a moist environment. Because if they um, are in a dry environment or an arid environment, you know, they tend not to survive or do too well there because they're not getting oxygen into their system as well as they could be if they were in a moist environment. So through my work at IUP, I found a few things. Um, I've identified genetically unique populations found throughout Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, Nicaragua, and Costa Rica. Um, and I've created a genetic framework for studying these frogs throughout the area. So, you know, the, the first thing that you need to do when approaching any type of um, study looking at a particular organism is that you need to know an accurate taxonomy because taxonomy is the name associated with the organism. So if we don't know the name of, you know, these populations of frogs throughout this area, how are we supposed to actually conduct any type of scientific study on them? So what, what truly what my work has done was I've identified these unique populations that don't have any type of um, taxonomic or taxonomic classification to them. So then we get to assign names to these populations. Um, given further studies, but hopefully we get to name some more of these populations and accurately catalog all of the biodiversity that's there. And then to final, finally, I just want to show you know some pictures of my experiences in the field when I was in Honduras over the summer. Um, so here we have actually one of our sites in Euskaran. It's you know, this really high mountaintop. And we have on our left here, we have just this, you know, this vast open space, the mountain ranges that you could see for miles upon miles ahead. And then you have the sample site where we actually collected all the frogs, where we collected a lot of them. And then here's some, just us trying to get into the forest as well. Uh, yeah, you can see it's very dense. So it can be a very intense hike up through this area. And then finally, I just want to wrap up with some of the frogs that I've actually um, caught and cataloged. And with that, I'll take any questions that everyone may have. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. That's really neat. Um, it seems like you have seen a lot of frogs. Our first, <laughs> our first question coming in, um, is from, uh, let's see, from Jack Holmes, was wondering if anyone's doing any studies related to these different populations that you talked about related to climate change. 
Yeah. So interestingly enough, so first off, what what you really have to do is you have to understand one the relationships between all of these frogs in the area. So um, you can't really study anything regarding climate change unless you know for sure what like the distributions of these frogs are. So yeah, so you really have to know where they're at first in order to then determine how um, how the climate fluctuations are influencing their ranges or how far they can disperse or move or anything like that. Um, but there are studies that look at how, um, you know, projecting into the future, like if it gets extremely hot in certain locations, how well they'll perform or even going backwards, you can see um, how their ranges were, you know, at the last um, glacial max. So, you know, there's various things that you can do with it, but yeah, that's definitely something people look at in the field. Cool. Um, so our, our next question is, how did you get into studying these frogs or first get excited about doing science like this? Yeah. So when I first started, when I first joined a lab at Penn State University, I entered into a lab looking at um, sort of parasitic plants and how they diversify throughout the Caribbean islands and how they move throughout the islands. Mm -hmm. And then sort of, I took my skill set that I learned there and I, and I really just went, I was applying to schools and then I found IUP. And then that's where I sort of started studying amphibians and realized how cool they were. Mm -hmm. Um, mainly because they are, you know, extremely impacted by, um, climactic fluctuations that are ultimately caused by us. So, you know, we have a large impact on these organisms and I feel that it's important to study, you know, living things that are still around while, you know, while they're still around. Yeah. Cool. Um, so our next question comes from Griffin Toscano who wants to know about how long do these leopard frogs live? Oh, that's, that's, that's a good question. So depending pretty much with any organism, it depends on, um, you know, if you have them in captivity or you have them in the wild, mm -hmm. um, I, I personally am not sure on the accurate age that they typically live. Um, but you can definitely see, see them going throughout sort of their tadpole their metamorph to their adult stage. And then, you know, at least a few other years of sort of reproduction as well. So, you know, I would say at a minimum of maybe maybe three years, but I mean, you could you could definitely find frogs out there that are you know well older that have just survived in in the elements for a long time. Cool. Um, so our next question um, comes from comes from one of our audience members who uh, wants to know how genetically similar are the um, Rana frogs that you're studying. Um, in Costa Rica to what we might find here in the United States? Ah, yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So um, mainly the North American leopard frog um, is named Ronopipians. Mm -hmm. So Ronopipians, it's, it's difficult to say exactly how genetically um, distant they are from each other, but if I would, if I were to show you a phylogenetic tree, um, these ones cluster together, like the ones in Costa Rica cluster together more than the ones in North America. And as you go throughout the areas, um, each of the unique regional populations tend to cluster with each other. So it's in typically like the ones I found, they're more or less like one or 2% genetically different from each other, like these populations in general. Mm -hmm. So um, the North American populations are very, very distant. And if you think about it, you know, they're not reproducing or her, there's no genetic information going from the populations in North America down to, you know, the ones in Costa Rica or yeah. any of the ones in Central America. So just over time, you know, they tend to grow very genetically distinct. Cool. Um, so when you're out doing your field work in some of those photos that you showed us hiking through those jungles, do you ever find anything other than frogs out there? Oh yeah. Yeah. So, so when you're, when you're going through those jungles, um, one thing 
is that I'm not a big fan of insects. Like I don't mind insects, mm -hmm. but you know, every, every 10 feet, you'll see something that you feel like is completely brand new that you've never seen before. Oh, so, wow. so, so you'll see insects that are ranging from, you know, maybe an inch to like six inches long, or I um, see a lot of snakes. You see a lot of, um, we actually caught a few pit vipers. So we caught some very venomous snakes. Um, you know, there's various lizards, mammals. There was actually, there was some type of mammal that was actually stalking us. Like he wasn't really stalking. He was just following us because he was curious, yeah. but we would be running, we would be going through the paths and then we would see something up in the trees and we would look up and it's this mammal just looking down at us, just trying to figure out what, what we're doing because we're in his, we're, we're in its habitat. So, you know, he's just very curious. <laughs> well, cool. Uh, so in your data collection, are you traveling with a team of people who are just studying frogs or do you have other types of scientists with you as well? Yeah. So that all depends on the composition of your team. Um, typically you, you will have like a large group of individuals because, you know, it costs a lot of money to do these expeditions. So when you pull in different researchers, yeah, there might be a few people that are looking at just amphibians like I would be. Mm -hmm. But there's also other people that are going to be looking for, you know, various um, snakes, even plants. So you have, um, you know, a wide variety of disciplines and, you know, just people going out to help sample as well. So, you know, if you have a larger team, everyone's going to help collect everyone else's organism. So it really works out. Neat. Um, perfect. And then the, the last question I have for you today is if you have any advice for any of the students watching at home who might be interested in studying amphibians or just studying nature around them, um, but might be wondering how they might be able to do that. Yeah, so um, for me, like I was always someone, like I, I, I was out outdoors, I always went out in nature a little bit, but I was never someone who truly got out in nature like I wish I would have when I was a kid. Um, I do a lot of computer work and I play a lot of video games. So like those things go hand in hand, um, a lot of statistical programs, but I would say if, you know, the best thing to do is to just go outside, um, go outside to your local park, um, go outside to like, you know, go to your trail systems that you have close to you. Um, you know, try not to disturb any habitats, but if you, if you observe any animals in nature, you know, observe from a distance, keep your distance, be careful about what you're, you know, trying to catch and look at. Um, but yeah, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, you know, given the level that some people are at like, you know, a, sort of um, identifying reptiles and amphibians and everything, you don't really know what's venomous or poisonous. So, you know, stay from a distance. You could take pictures. Um, that's actually a really good thing to do. Take pictures of wildlife around you and then, actually go back to your home and maybe look up and try to identify what you have actually taken um, photographs of. And that's like sort of the basics of taxonomy is, you know, identifying what's around you. And that's sort of the, the best applied way of, you know, being in nature, I, I feel. Cool. I love it. Go outside and make some observations, figure out what's living around where you are. Yeah. Cool. That's great. Well, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. We really appreciate it. And um, it was awesome to hear about all the great research that you've done on frogs and kind of what that's like to be a, a scientist doing the research that you're doing. Yes. Thank you very much for having me. Awesome. Thank you.